What's that? Do you see that over there? It looks like an iron. Let me just... <sniffs> Ooh, that's cold. Perfect. In my previous review of Made in Abyss's second season, which you can watch right here, click the link, smash the subscribe button, ring the bell, are you happy now, YouTube? I mentioned that horror is something I'm very bad with for the most part. What I ought to have said to further elaborate was that when I said horror in that context, I actually meant in the literary definition, the repulsed, shocked, disgusted reaction someone gets when they see something visceral, disturbing, or disgusting, as opposed to the idea of horror as in terror as in this. That's... that's you. Fuck me! Okay, well... <laughs> that sense of horror was the same feeling I had when I watched the first episode of Dora Hedora a while back, and it was what stopped me from watching more. And I say this because Chainsaw Man really ought to elicit a similar response, and yet it doesn't, for a great deal of reasons, at least one or three or eight I'll delve into going forwards. Well, at least it didn't in the source material, you see, cleverly leaving a little hook for later there. But who is this Chainsaw's Man? You know, that's a very good question. I've been wondering that myself. That said, I would warrant we've all at least heard the name, eye-catching in its simplicity as it is. But just to cover all the bases and inflate my word count, Chainsaw Man is... He's not really... He's not a man. He's like 16. I guess depending on what culture you're from, that might constitute a man, but in my mind that's more that's sort of a boy. And they're not really his chainsaws, so it's really all just a bunch of nonsense, frankly. The titular Chainsaw Man is a guy called Denji, who, by way of fusion with the Chainsaw Devil, has chainsaws in his hands and arms, and sometimes, if he's feeling particularly spicy, his legs. He's like a superhero by way of Cinco, effectively. He accepts an invitation from Makima, a pretty lady wearing tight pants, who also happens to be the head of an anti-devil government arm to chop up devils for the benefit of society, with the ultimate goal of laying his hands upon the vessel of the hopes and dreams of humankind, a boob. Well, certainly initially, at least. I know quite a few people personally who were fairly turned off by that premise, and whilst I can't fault them for finding it unappealingly crass, Chainsaw Man belongs to that smart, dumb pantheon of shows like Gurren Lagann, where there's actually a lot of subtext and emotive character work if you're willing to push past the initial puerility, although Chainsaw's adaptation obviously presents with a bit more maturity than the simple plot point would suggest, sort of like the opposite of how I present with a bit more intelligence than I actually possess by using words like puerility. I won't deny that it does read like a a blatant grab at fan service, in this case literally, but a cursory read will only ever get you so far. In reality, given what a horrible life he's had and how he's not been afforded any kind of moral or intellectual education, we, as the audience, know what Denji actually wants is just a reasonable standard of living, positive affirmation, and people he cares about and who care about him. He's either too warped to know it himself or else forgets it far too easily, and the plot is smart enough to backseat that after the first episode or so. I think if I were forced to categorize Chainsaw Man, possibly at gunpoint in some sort of karmic repayment for all the rubbish I've canted onto the internet, I'd call it a Bildungsroman. Although Denji doesn't really come of age in the traditional sense, he hardly even self-actualizes, really. If it's a coming-of-age story, he barely makes it past pre-teen by the end of season one. He doesn't grow up, he doesn't really even become a better person, he just loses some naivete and starts to understand what it is he really wants, and it takes a long time and a lot of carnage to get there. He also chops up some devils with his chainsaws from time to time, and so we have the kind of push and pull of the narrative Denji's simplistic, almost animalistic nature is juxtaposed to characters that represent what he could be on multiple ends of the spectrum, through Power and Aki, his co-workers and roommates, and ultimately, what blossoms is a story that, like the late Miss Fisher said, is about family, and that's what's so powerful about it. A very strange, dysfunctional family, I admit, but still. At this point, you'd have a harder time finding a non-dysfunctional found family, and yes, I did enjoy Spy X Family, thank you for asking. Although, really, every major cast member is a bit of a dirtbag on the surface, if charmingly so. The internet collectively fawned over power after her introduction and then promptly said, actually, give me a bit, I need to think about this, after finding out she doesn't flush the toilet. I remember with great fondness when Tatsuki Fujimoto, the original work's author, excitedly declared that his Jujutsu Kaisen ripoff was getting an anime adaptation by the same studio that adapted Jujutsu Kaisen, so it's no surprise that the team dynamic in Chainsaw Man is like a more exaggerated more extreme version of the core cast from that series. 
over-the-top hot-headed protagonist with a bit of devil in him, crass, strong, violent junior, cool, calm, put upon senior, you know the drill. The biggest difference between the two series is in how much more extreme the characters are in Chainsaw Man, and the same can be said for basically every aspect of the plot. Expansion of scale and deepening of stakes is practically its main forte, alongside gratuitous violence and very cinematic animation. Speaking of cinematicism, back in university I took a couple of courses on screenwriting and in one of the early seminars the professor stressed the importance of what they called a logline, the plot summarized in two sentences or less. Since Fujimoto is a big fan of Western cinema, if I were writing one for Chainsaw Man, it would probably go something like, In a world where brutal monster attacks are an everyday occurrence, a crude 16-year-old boy who's lived in poverty under the iron thumb of the Yakuza bonds with a chainsaw devil and becomes a monster-killing anti-hero so he can live a happier life with his newfound family, unless the devils or his employers kill him first. And really, that's the thrust of it. It's an awful world, but the world Denji's lived in was even worse, so the slightest uptick in quality of life for him is enough for him to bet his life for. The driving emotional core of Chainsaw Man is, in my eyes, the process of Denji maturing from an ignorant boar who doesn't know what he wants into a slightly more self-actualized ignorant boar who might figure out what he wants if he's given a few years and a self-help book or two. M maybe. Alright, that's a bit generous. Frankly, I'd almost call Chainsaw Man a tragedy if it didn't present itself with such a tongue-in-cheek tone. At least, in the manga. Ooh, there we go. That's that tripwire from earlier. Before I start talking about this, allow me to reaffirm, and I can't say this readily enough, I think Chainsaw Man in both its anime and its manga form is very good. It's genuinely a really entertaining series, and Fujimoto's affection for cinematics and cinema in general bleeds through the adaptation in a way unfeasible in the still images of the manga. Camera angles, sound design, editing, the way things move through the frame, it's all very filmic, impressive, and well executed. The opening being a pastiche of various iconic moments in popular Hollywood and beyond has become common knowledge even, and I don't doubt Fujimoto had a major hand in that, so rather than belaboring the point with further waffling, I'll simply say this. Chainsaw Man the animation feels to me a very different beast to Chainsaw Man the manga, and I think that's owing largely to how much harder it is to convey tone in manga than it is in anime. When in one panel there's nothing, and then in the other there's a shocking burst of sudden gratuitous violence, it's very much on the reader to figure out how they want to interpret that. Is the sudden cacophony of violence funny or shocking or what have you? Context gets you to the halfway point, but the reader is going to have to make a tonal inference sooner or later. In the anime they have a lot more work to do, and as a result I think that perturbed viewers who expected something a bit more, to use a stupid pun, comic, or at least off the wall, like Dora Hidoro or perhaps Van's footwear. To be clear, this was not my read of the entire manga, where one prominent character death read as intentionally downplayed to me, another one much later on in the series did hit me as being very tragic, so it isn't black and white. I've said time and again, I'm a huge sucker for incidental music, especially in anime where I feel like it's given a bit more weight than it is normally. Kensuke Ushio's score for Chainsaw Man has a few very notable standouts, one in particular entitled Sweet Dreams is tremendously emotive and contributes a shockingly poignant tone to the scenes in which it's used, which means it directs the way scenes feel in ways that they have more gravitas. Based on his work on a silent voice, perhaps that was to be expected, but the aforementioned death scene hit far harder by the emotiveness of the voice acting and the score that punctuated the moment, and obviously that's just something that's going to happen when you turn a few panels on a few pages into a multiple minutes long sequence of animation, it's inevitable. It highlights the tragic elements that felt more seemingly intentionally dulled in the manga, and whilst this is perhaps the most subjective hinge I've based a review on to date, I do feel like the show somehow hits a, forgive me for the obvious absurdity, grounded tone to it than the manga did, even more so than something like Made in Abyss, although I readily admit that I read the manga for Made in Abyss after watching the show, so that's a very biased example. In the manga, the goings-on felt absurdly over the top. Denji's mistreatment at the hands of the Yakuza felt darkly comical almost when he calmly lists off all the organs he's donated to pay for the debts he's accrued. It's so absurdly bleak that it struck me as being almost a joke in and of itself. The show, however, treats his plight with a lot more gravity and what once struck me as a joke becomes substantially more tragic and disturbing, but by the same token, the subsequent moment when he becomes
becomes Chainsaw Man felt a lot more triumphant and exciting as a result, but again, these are not bad things, even if the tones are different. The anime stands on its own merits and then some. As I've said before, it's a very well animated thing. I know a lot of people have a knee-jerk response to CG when they see it, and that's not entirely unwarranted. It's a cost-saving measure, and oftentimes it's very poorly composited into the scene. I don't think that was the case with much of the CG use in CSM, and obviously chainsaws have a lot of moving parts, so it's understandable that that decision was made. It's composited well enough, and some of the action scenes that use it are genuinely kinetic and exciting to watch, so I would say it's a worthwhile trade-off. Chainsaw Man is a very cynical, almost comically bleak story where life is taken cheaply, suddenly, and indifferently, but there's a genuine emotion beating through the chainsaw where its heart used to be. I think that's one of the big reasons it took off the way it did, ultimately. It is more than the simplistic gore-fest send-up its title would have you think it is. It is about a man who chops devils up with chainsaws to touch a boob, yes, but I don't think I'm giving it too much credit to say that the real story is a more surprisingly uplifting affair. It is as cliche as it sounds about family, but it's also about how deeply flawed people can have a positive impact on each other without even trying, and it's about not taking what you already have for granted, a lesson that our characters all too often realize too late, hence the innate undercurrent of tragedy this seemingly bombastic, high-octane series has just beneath its surface. Like Gurren Lagann, it's both exactly what it claims to be, and it's far, far more emotive than you would suspect going in, and that's why I'm ending the review on a note like this, you see? You could slap the action music over this for a cool ending stinger, but here we are wallowing in melancholy. Welcome to my channel. That is to say, I don't dislike the narrative being presented with an even marginally more self-serious tone. The elements were always there, and I certainly wouldn't think anyone bemoaned Pochi's loss as being more emotive. I remarked after watching the first episode that they had nailed not only the action and intensity of the series, but the softer moments as well, and that sentiment was very much true for the rest of the run as well. We'll see if the contrarian devil has anything to say about me going forwards, but I, at the very least, am glad to have watched it.